As we had determined the day before to seize Montezuma, we were praying to God all that night that it would turn out in a manner redounding to his holy service, and the next morning the what should be done was settled. Cortez took with him five captains who were Pedro de Alvarado, Gonzalo de Sandoval, Juan Velasquez de Leon, Francisco de Lugo, and Alonso de Avila, and he took me and our interpreters, Doña Marina and Aguilar, and he told us all to keep on the alert, and the horsemen to have their horses saddled and bridled. As for our arms, I need not call them to mind, for by day or night we always went armed and with our sandals on our feet, for at that time such was our footgear, and Montezuma had always seen us armed in that way when we went to speak to him, so did not take it as anything new, nor was he disturbed at all. When we were all ready, our captain sent to tell Montezuma that we were coming to his palace, where this had always been our custom, and so that he should not be alarmed by our arriving suddenly. Montezuma understood more or less that Cortez was coming because he was annoyed about the Villarica affair, and he was afraid of him, but sent word for him to come, and that he would be welcome. When Cortez entered, after having made his usual salutations, he said to him through our interpreters, Signor Montezuma, I am very much astonished that you, who are such a valiant prince, after having declared that you are our friend, should order your captains, whom you have stationed on the coast near Tuspan, to take arms against my Spaniards, and that they should dare to rob the towns which we are in the keeping of, and under the protection of our king and master, and to demand of them Indian men and women for sacrifice, and should kill a Spaniard, one of my brothers, and a horse. He did not wish to speak of the captain, nor of the six soldiers who died as soon as they arrived at Villarica, for Montezuma did not know about it, nor did the Indian captains who had attacked them. And Cortez went on to say, Being such a friend of yours, I ordered my captains to do all that was possible to help and serve you, and you have done exactly the contrary to us. Also in the affair at Cholula, your captains and a large force of warriors had received your own commands to kill us. I forgave it at the time, out of my great regard for you, but now again your vassals and captains have become insolent and hold secret consultations stating that you wish us to be killed. I do not wish to begin a war on this account, nor to destroy this city. I am willing to forgive it all, if silently and without raising any disturbance, you will come with us to our quarters, where you'll be as well served and attended as though you were in your own house. But if you cry out or make any disturbance, you will immediately be killed by these my captains, whom I have brought solely for this purpose. When Montezuma heard this, he was terrified and dumbfounded, and replied that he had never ordered his people to take arms against us, and that he would at once send to summon his captains so that the truth should be known, and he would chastise them. And at that very moment he took from his arm and wrist the sign and seal of Huichilobos, which was only done when he gave an important and weighty command, which was to be carried out at once. With regard to being taken prisoner and leaving his palace against his will, he said that he was not the person to whom such an order could be given, and that he would not go. Cortez replied to him with very good arguments, and Montezuma answered him with even better, and showing that he ought not to leave his house. In this way, more than half an hour was spent over talk. And when Juan Velasquez de Leon and the other captains saw that they were wasting time over it, and could not longer await the moment when they should remove him from his house and hold him prisoner, they spoke to Cortez somewhat angrily and said, What is the good of your making so many words? Let us either take him prisoner or stab him. Tell him once more that if he cries out or makes an uproar, we will kill him, for it is better at once to save our lives or to lose them. And as Juan Velasquez said this with a loud and rather terrifying voice, for such was his way of speaking, Montezuma, who saw that our captains were angered, asked Doña Marina what they were saying in such loud tones. As Doña Marina was very clever, she said, Signor Montezuma, what I counsel you is to go at once to their quarters, without any disturbance at all, for I know that they will pay you much honor as a great prince, such as you are. Otherwise you will remain here a dead man, but in their quarters you will learn the truth. Then Montezuma said to Cortez, Signor Malinche, if this is what you desire, I have a son and two legitimate daughters. Take them as hostages, 
and do not put this affront on me. What will my chieftains say if they see me taken off as a prisoner? Cortez replied to him that he must come with them himself, and there was no alternative. At the end of much more discussion that took place, Montezuma said that he would go willingly, and then Cortez and our captains bestowed many caresses on him and told him that they begged him not to be annoyed and to tell his captains and the men of his guard that he was going of his own free will because he had spoken to his idol Huichilobos and the priests who attended him and that it was beneficial for his health and the safety of his life that he should be with us. His rich litter, in which he was used to go out with all the captains who accompanied him, was promptly brought, and he went to our quarters, where we placed guards and watchmen over him. All the attentions and amusements which it was possible for him to have, both Cortez and all of us did our best to afford him, and he was not put under any personal restraint. And soon all the principal Mexican chieftains and his nephews came to talk with him, and to learn the reason of his seizure, and whether he wished them to attack us. Montezuma answered them that he was delighted to be here some days with us of his own free will, and not by force, and that when we, he wished for anything he would tell them so, and that they must not excite themselves, nor the city, nor were they to take it to heart, for what had happened about his being there was agreeable to his Wichilobos, and certain priests who knew had told him so, for they had spoken to the idol about it. In this way, which I have now related, the capture of the great Montezuma was effected. There, where he remained, he had his service and his women and his baths in which he bathed himself, and twenty great chiefs always stayed in his company, holding their ancient offices, as well as his counselors and captains, and he stayed there a prisoner without showing any anger at it and ambassadors from distant lands came there with their suites and brought him his tribute, and he carried on his important business. I will not say anything more at present about this imprisonment, and will relate how the messengers whom Montezuma sent with his sign and seal to some of the captains who had killed our soldiers brought them before him as prisoners, and what he said to them I do not know, but he sent them on to Cortez so that he might do justice to them, and their confession was taken when Montezuma was not present, and they confessed that what I have already stated was true, that their prince had ordered them to wage war and to exact tribute, and that if any tales should appear in defense of the towns, they too should be attacked or killed. When Cortez heard this confession, he sent to inform Montezuma how it implicated him in the affair, and Montezuma made all the excuses he could, and our captain sent him word that he believed the confession himself, but that although Montezuma deserved punishment in conformity with the ordinances of our king, to the effect that any person causing others, whether guilty or innocent, to be killed, shall die for it, yet he was so fond of him and wished him so well that even if that crime lay at his door, he, Cortez, would pay the penalty with his own life sooner than allow Montezuma's to pass away. With all this that Cortez sent to tell him, Montezuma felt anxious, and without any further discussion, Cortez sentenced those captains to death and to be burned in front of Montezuma's palace. This sentence was promptly carried out, and so that there could be no obstruction while they were being burned, Cortez ordered shackles to be put on Montezuma himself, and when this was done, Montezuma roared with rage, and if before this he was scared, he was then much more so. After the burning was over, our Cortez, with five of our captains, went to Montezuma's apartment, and Cortez himself took off the fetters, and he spoke such loving words to him that his anger soon passed off, for our Cortez told him that he not only regarded him as a brother, but much more, and that, as he was already lord and king of so many towns and provinces, if it were possible, he would make him lord of many more countries as time went on, such as he had not been able to subdue, and which did not now obey him. And he told him that if he now wished to go to his palace, that he would give him leave to go. Cortez told him this through our interpreters, and while Cortez was saying it, the tears apparently sprang to Montezuma's eyes. He answered with great courtesy that he thanked him for it. But he well knew that Cortez's speech was mere words, and that now at present it was better for him to stay there a prisoner. For there was danger. As his chieftains were numerous, and his nephews and relations came every day to him to say that it would be a good thing to attack us and free him from prison, that as soon as they saw him outside they might drive him to do it. 
and he did not wish to see revolutions in the city. But if he did not comply with their wishes, possibly they would want to set up another prince in his place. And so he was putting those thoughts out of our heads by saying that Huichilobos had sent him word that he should remain a prisoner. From what we understood, and there is no doubt about it, Cortez had told Aguilar to tell Montezuma secretly that although Malinche wished to release him from his imprisonment, the rest of our captains and soldiers would not agree to it. When he heard this reply, Cortez threw his arms round him and embraced him and said, It is not in vain, Signor Montezuma, that I care for you as I care for myself. Then Montezuma asked Cortez that a Spanish page named Ortegilla, who I already knew something of his language, might attend on him. And this was very advantageous both for Montezuma and for us, for through this page Montezuma asked and learned many things about Spain, and we learned what his captain said to him, and in truth this page was so serviceable that Montezuma got to like him very much. Let us cease talking about how Montezuma became fairly contented with the great flattery and attention he received, and the conversation that he had with us, and whenever we passed before him, even if it was Cortez himself, we doffed our mailed caps or helmets, for we always went armed, and he treated us all with politeness. The name of the principal captain who was punished by being burned was Quetzalcoatl. I may say that when the news of this punishment spread about through our provinces of New Spain, they were terrified, and the towns of the coast, where they had killed our soldiers, returned again and rendered good service to the settlers who remained in Via Rica. After justice had been done on Quetzalcoatl and his captains and the great Montezuma had been tamed, our captain decided to send to Via Rica as his lieutenant, a soldier named Alonso de Grado, who was a very prudent man of good address and presence, and a musician and a great writer. This Alonso de Grado was one of those who were always in opposition of our Cortes about going to Mexico, and wished us to go back to Via Rica. And when at the time of the Tlaxcala affair there were certain meetings of the discontented, it was always Alonso de Grado who agitated. Had he been as good a man of war as he was a man of good manners, it would have been to his advantage. I say this because when Cortez gave him this appointment, as he was not a bold man, he was facetious in his remarks, and said to him, Here, Signor Alonso de Grado, you have your wish fulfilled, for you are going now to Villarica as you have wished, and you will take charge of the fortress, and take care that you don't go out on any expeditions, and get killed as one day at Calante did. And when he was saying this to him, Cortez winked his eye, so that we soldiers who were standing round might see it, and we knew why he said this. For it was well known of Alonso de Grado that he would not go on such an expedition, even if he were ordered to do so with threats. Cortez charged him to look well after the settlers, and to see that he caused no annoyance to our Indian allies, and to take nothing from them by force. While Alonso de Grado arrived at the town, he gave himself great importance towards the settlers, and wished to make them to do him service as a great lord. And to the allied towns which numbered more than thirty, he sent to demand jewels of gold and pretty Indian women, and he paid no attention at all to the fortress. How he spent his time was in feeding well and in gambling, and what was worse than all of this, he secretly called together his friends, and even some who were not his friends, and suggested that if Diego Velasquez or any of his captains should come from Cuba to that country, that they should join him and give up the land to him. All this news was at once sent in haste by letter to Cortez in Mexico, and it seemed to Cortez advisable to send some man whom he could trust to the port and town. So he sent Gonzalo de Sandoval. When Gonzalo de Sandoval arrived at Villarica, he sent Alonso de Grado as a prisoner to Mexico, under a guard of Indians, for so Cortez had told him to do. When Alonso de Grado reached Mexico, Cortez would not allow him to be brought before him, but he ordered him to be imprisoned in some wooden stocks, which had just been newly made, and he remained a prisoner for two days. As Alonso de Grado was very plausible, and a man of many expedients, he made many promises to Cortez that he would be his humble servant and loyal to him in all things, and gave so many indications of his desire to serve him that at length he convinced him and he gained his release. I must not forget to say that when Cortez sent Gonzalo de Sandoval to Villarica, he had ordered him, 
as soon as he arrived, to send two blacksmiths with all their apparatus of bellows and tools and much iron from the ships which we had destroyed, and two great iron chains which were already made, and he told them to send also sails and tackle and pitch and tow and a mariner's compass and everything else that was needed to build two sloops to sail on the Lake of Mexico. These things Sandoval sent at once, following in every particular the orders he had received. As our captain was careful in all things, and seeing that Montezuma was a prisoner, and fearing that he might become depressed at being shut in and confined, he endeavored every day after prayers, for we had no wine for mass, to go and pay court to him. And he went, accompanied by four captains, usually by Pedro de Alvarado, Juan Velasquez, and Diego de Arda, and with much reverence they asked Montezuma how he was, and that he should issue his orders and they would all be carried out, so that he should not be weary of his confinement. He answered that on the contrary, being a prisoner rested him, and this was because our gods gave us power to confine him, or his witchy lobos permitted it, and in one conversation after another they gave him to understand more fully the things about our holy faith and the great power of the Emperor, our Lord. Then, sometimes Montezuma and Cortez would play at Totolok, which is the name they give to a game played with some very smooth, small pellets made of gold for this game. And they tossed these pellets to some distance, as well as some little slabs, which were also made of gold, and in five strokes, tries, they gained or lost certain pieces of gold or rich jewels that they staked. I remember that Pedro de Alvarado was keeping the score for Cortez, and one of his nephews, a great cacique, was marking for Montezuma, and Pedro de Alvarado always marked one point more than Cortez gained. And when Montezuma saw it, he said courteously and laughingly that he did not like Donatillo, for so they called Pedro de Alvarado, to keep the score for Cortez because he made so many yeshoshul in what he marked, which in their language means to say that he cheated, and that he always marked one point too many. Cortez and all of us soldiers who were on guard at the time could not restrain our laughter at what the great Montezuma said, because Pedro de Alvarado, although he was so handsome and well-mannered, had a mania for excessive talking, and we knew his temperament. To return to the game, if Cortez won, he gave the jewels to those nephews and favorites of Montezuma who attended on him, and if Montezuma won, he divided them among us soldiers on guard. And in addition to what he gave us from the game, he never omitted giving us every day presents of gold and cloth, both to us and to the captain of the guard, who at that time was Juan Velasquez de Leon, who showed himself in every way to be the friend and servant of Montezuma. A soldier named Pedro Lopez was placed as sentinel over Montezuma, and on the question whether it was time to change the watch during the night, he had words with an officer and said, Oh, curse this dog, I'm sick to death of keeping constant guard over him. Montezuma heard the expression and waited in his mind, and when Cortez came to pay his court to him, he heard of it, and was so angry about it that he had Pedro Lopez, good soldier as he was, flogged in our quarters, and from that time on all the soldiers who came on guard went through their watch in silence and good manners. However, it was not necessary to give orders to many of us who stood guard over him about the civility that we ought to show to this great cacique. He knew each one of us and even knew our names and our characters, and he was so kind that to all of us he gave jewels and to some mantles and handsome Indian women. As I was a young man in those days, whenever I was on guard or passed in front of him, I doffed my headpiece with the greatest respect, and the page Ortegia had told him that I had been on two expeditions to discover New Spain before the time of Cortez, so I asked Ortegia to beg Montezuma to do me the favor of giving me a very pretty Indian woman. And when Montezuma heard that, he told them to call me, and he said to me, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, they tell me that you have quantities of cloth and gold, and I will order them to give you today a pretty maid. Treat her very well, for she is the daughter of a chieftain, and they will always give you gold and mantles. And I answered him with much reverence, that I kissed his hands for his great favor, and might God our Lord prosper him, and it seems that he asked the page what I replied to him, and he told him. Montezuma said to him, Bernal Diaz seems to me to be a gentleman, for as I have said, he knew all our names, and he told them to give me three small slabs of gold and two loads of mantles. Let us stop talking of this, and tell how of a morning after, saying his prayers, and 
making sacrifices to his idols, he took his breakfast, which was a small matter, for he ate no meat, only chili peppers. Then he was occupied for an hour in hearing suits from many parts brought by the Gaziks, who came to him from distant lands. As all the materials for building the two sloops had arrived, Cortez at once went to tell the great Montezuma that he wished to build two small ships so as to take pleasure trips on the lake and asked him to send his carpenters to cut the wood, together with our experts in boat building, who were named Martin Lopez and Andre Nunez. As the oak timber was distant about four leagues, it was soon brought and shaped, and as there were many Indian carpenters, the boats, the boats were soon built and caulked and tarred, and their rigging was set up and their sails cut to the right size and measurement, and an awning provided for each one. And they turned out to be as good and fast as though they had taken a month to set up the models, for Martin Lopez was a past master of the art. Let us leave this, and say that Montezuma told Cortez that he wished to go to his temples and make sacrifices, and pay the devotion to his gods that it was his duty to do, so that his captains and chieftains might observe it, especially certain nephews of his who came every day to tell him that they wished to free him and to attack us, and he answered them that it pleased him to be with us, so they should think it was as he had told them, that his god Huichilobos had commanded him to stay with us, as he had made them believe before. Cortez replied that as to this permission he asked for, he should be aware not to do anything for which he might lose his life, and so as to prevent any disorders or commands to his captains or priests either to release him or attack us, he would send captains and soldiers with him who would immediately stab him to death should any change be noticed in his bearing. He might go and welcome, but must not sacrifice any human beings, for that was a great offense against the true God. That was to the God we were preaching to him about, and they were st there stood our altars in the image of Our Lady before whom he could pray. Montezuma said that he would not sacrifice a single human being, and he set off in his rich litter in great state with many great caciques in his company, as was his custom, and they had carried his insignia in front of him in the form of a sort of staff or rod, which was the sign that his royal presence was going that way, just as they do now to the viceroys of New Spain. There went with him as a guard four of our captains and one hundred and fifty soldiers, and the Padre de la Merced, who also with, uh, with us to stop the sacrifice if he should offer human beings. So we went to the queue of Huichilobos, and when we came near to that cursed temple, Montezuma ordered them to take him from his litter, and he was carried on the shoulders of his nephews and of other caciques until he arrived at the temple. As I have already stated, as he went through the streets, all the chieftains cast down their eyes and never looked at his face. When we arrived at the foot of the steps leading to the oratory, there were many priests waiting to help him with their arms in the ascent. There had already been sacrificed the night before, four Indians, and in spite of what our captain said and the dissuasions of the Padre de la Merced, he paid no heed but persisted in killing men and boys to accomplish his sacrifice, and we could do nothing at that time, only pretend not to notice it, for Mexico and the other great cities were very ready to rebel under the nephews of Montezuma, as I shall explain further on. When Montezuma had completed his sacrifices, and he did not tarry much in making them, we returned with him to our quarters, and he was very cheerful, and gave presents of gold and jewels to us soldiers who had accompanied him. When the two sloops were finished building, and had been launched, and the masts and rigging had been set up, and adorned with the royal and imperial banners, and the sailors had been got ready to navigate them, they went out in them, both rowing and sailing, and they sailed very well. When Montezuma heard of it, he said to Cortez that he wished to go hunting on a rocky island, standing in the lake, which was preserved, so that no one dared to hunt there, however great a chief he might be, under pain of death. Cortez replied that he was very welcome to go, but he must remember what he had told him on the former occasion, when he went to visit his idols, that to raise any disturbances was more than his life was worth. Moreover, he could go in the sloops, as it was better sailing in them than in the canoes and pirogues however large they might be. Montezuma said that he would be delighted to sail in the sloop that was the swiftest, and he took with him many lords and chieftains, and advised his huntsmen to follow in canoes and pirogues. A son of Montezuma and many caciques went in the other sloop. 
Then Cortes ordered Velasquez de Leon, who was captain of the guard, and Pedro de Alvarado, and Cristobal de Olid, and Alonso de Alvila, with two hundred soldiers, to accompany Montezuma, and to remember the great responsibility he was placing on them in looking after him. And as all those captains whom I have named were very alert, they took on board all the soldiers I have spoken about, and four bronze cannon, and all the powder that we possessed, and our gunners, and they put up a highly decorated awning as a protection against the weather, and Montezuma and his chieftains went under it. At that time there was a strong breeze blowing, and the sailors were delighted to please and content Montezuma. They worked the sails so well that they went flying along, and the canoes which held his huntsmen and chieftains were left far behind in spite of the large number of rowers they carried. Montezuma was charmed and said that it was a great art of this combining sails and oars together. So he arrived at the Penul, which was not very far off, and Montezuma killed all the game he wanted, deer and hares and rabbits, and returned very contented to the city. When we arrived in Mexico, Pedro de Alvarado and Juan Velasquez de Leon and the other captains ordered the cannon to be discharged, and this delighted Montezuma. And as we saw him so frank and kind, we treated him with the respect in which the kings of these countries are held, and he behaved in the same manner to us. If I were to relate the traits and qualities that he showed as a great prince, and the reverence and service that all the lords of New Spain paid to him, I should never come to an end. It was not a thing that he ordered to be brought. It was not immediately there. As Kakamatsin, lord of the city of Texcoco, which, after Mexico, is the largest and most important city that there is in New Spain, knew that his uncle Montezuma had been imprisoned for many days, and that we were taking the upper hand in every way that was possible, and also got to know that we had opened the chamber where the great treasure of his grandfather, Akshayaka, was kept, but had not taken anything from it. He determined before we could take possession of the treasure to call together all the lords of Texcoco, who were his vassals, and the lord of the Coyoacan, who was his cousin and Montezuma's nephew, and the lord of Tacuba, and the lord of Itzapalapa, and another great cacique who was lord of Matalcingo, who was very nearly related to Montezuma, and of whom it was even said that he was the rightful heir to the kingdom and lordship of Mexico, and who was a chieftain known among the Indians for his personal bravery. While Kakamatsin continued to negotiate with these and other Mexican chieftains, that on a given day they should come with all their forces and attack us, it seems that the cacique whom I have said was known for his personal bravery, whose name I do not know, said that if Kakamatsin would assure to him the kingship of Mexico, to which he was the rightful heir, that he and all his relations and the people of the province called Matalzingo would be the first to take up arms and turn us out of Mexico, or not leave any one of us alive. It appeared that Kakamatsin replied that the chieftainship of Mexico belonged to him, and that he himself must be king, for he was the nephew of Montezuma, and that the lord of Matalzingo did not wish to come, that they would make war on us without his help or that of his people, for it seems that Kakamatsin had got ready all the lords and towns already named by me, and had already arranged the day on which they were to fall on Mexico, and that the chieftains of his faction who were then in the city would facilitate their entry. While these negotiations were going on, Montezuma knew all about them from the Lord of Matalcingo, and, to be more sure of it, Montezuma sent to summon all the caciques and chieftains of Texcoco, and they told him how Kakamatsin was going about persuading them all with words and gifts to join him in an attack on us, and to free his uncle. As Montezuma was prudent and did not wish to see his city rise up in arms or riots, he told Cortes what was happening. Our captain and all us soldiers knew a good deal about this disturbance, but not so fully as Montezuma now detailed it. The advice that Cortes now gave him was that he should give us his Mexican followers, and we would fall on Texcoco and capture or destroy that city and its neighborhood. As that advice did not suit Montezuma, Cortes sent to tell Kakamatsin that he should cease his preparations for war, which would be the means of his own destruction, for he wished to have him as a friend. Now Kakamatsin was a young man who found many others who shared his opinions, ready to support him in the war. So he sent to tell Cortes that he understood his flatteries, and did not want to hear any more of them. Cortes again sent to tell him that he should beware not to do an ill turn to our king and lord, for he would pay for it with his person, and lose his life for it. He replied that he knew no king, and wished he had never known Cortes, who, for all his fair words, 
had imprisoned his uncle. As Montezuma had both great caciques and kinsmen in Teshkoko who were not friendly with Kakamatsin, who was very haughty and much disliked, and as he had with him there in Mexico a brother of this name, of the same Kakamatsin, a youth of a good disposition who had fled from his own brother to escape being killed by him, for after Kakamatsin he was the heir to the kingdom of Teshkoko, our captain implored Montezuma to concert measures with his people in Teshkoko to seize Kakamatsin, or to send secretly to summon him to come to Mexico, and if he did come, to lay hands on him and keep him in his power until he had quieted down, and later on should promote the southern nephew to be the lord of Teshkoko and take the chieftainship from Kakamatsin. Montezuma said that he would at once send to summon Kakamatsin, but he did not think he would come, and that if he did not come, he would make arrangements with his captains and relations to seize him. Cortez thanked him heartily for this, and even said, Senor Montezuma, you may indeed believe me that if you wish to go to your palace, you are free to do so. For since I understand that you are well disposed towards me, I am so devoted to you that were I not in such a difficult position, I would not even insist upon accompanying you when you proceed to your palace with all your nobility. If I have failed to carry out such a plan, it is on account of my captains who went to seize you, for they are not willing that I should set you free, and also because you say that you prefer to stay in confinement so as to avoid the disturbances through which your nephews would attempt to obtain power over this city of yours and deprive you of your rule. Montezuma thanked him, and as he began to understand Cortez's flattering speeches, and saw that he made them not with any intention of setting him free, but only to test his good will, he added that it was as well for him to remain a prisoner until he could see whether the treachery of his nephews would lead. Moreover, he would immediately send messengers to Kakamatsin, begging him to appear before him as he wished to speak to him about friendship between him and us. Montezuma sent the same message to the captains of Teshkoko, telling them that he was sending to summon his nephew to make friends, adding that they should beware how that youth turned their brains, so that they should take up arms against us. Kakamatsin took counsel with his chiefs as to what should be done, and began to bluster and say that he would kill us all within four days, and that his uncle was a chicken not to attack us when we advised him not to do so. Kakamatsin promised his followers there and then that if the lordship of Mexico should fall to him, he would make them great chieftains, and he also gave them many golden jewels, and told them that he had already made arrangements with his cousins, the lords of Coyoacan and Itzapalapa and Tacuba and other relations, to help him. And there were other chieftains in Mexico itself who would assist him and let him into the city at whatever hour he might choose. He said that some of them might go along the causeway, and all the rest could go across the lake in their pirogues and small canoes, and they would enter the city without meeting opponents to defend it, for his uncle was a prisoner. And they need have no fear of us, for they knew that only a few days ago in the affair of Almeria, his uncle's captains had killed many Teules, and a horse, and they had seen the head of a Teule and the body of the horse, that they could kill us all in an hour and could have feasts and stuff themselves with our bodies. When this speech was finished, they say that the captains looked at one another, waiting for those who usually spoke first in councils of war, and that four or five of these captains replied to him how was it possible for them to go without the permission of their great prince Montezuma, and wage war in his very house and city, that they should send first to lend him know about it, and if he consented, then it would accompany Kakamatsin with the greatest good will, but otherwise they did not wish to turn traitors. It seems the Kakamatsun was angered with the captains, and ordered three of those who gave that reply to be imprisoned. As there were present at that meeting and council others, who were his relations, who were longing for a riot, they said that they would aid him to the death. So he decided to send to his uncle the great Montezuma, to say that he ought to be ashamed of sending him word to come and make friends with those who had done him such harm and dishonor in holding him a prisoner that such a thing was only possible because we were wizards and had stolen away all his great strength and bravery with our witchcraft, and that our gods and this great lady from Castile, whom we said was our counselor, had given us the great power to do what we had done. The gist of his message was 
that he would come in spite of us and of his uncle to speak to us and to kill us. When the great Montezuma heard that insolent reply, he was greatly angered and at once sent to summon six of his most trusted captains. And he gave them his seal and ordered them to go to Texcoco and secretly to show that seal to certain captains and relations of his who were on bad terms with Kakamatsun on account of his haughtiness, and so to manage that they should make prisoners of Kakamatsun and those who were in his confidence, and bring them before him at once. When those captains had departed, and it was understood in Teshkoko what it was that Montezuma had ordered, as Kakamatsun was greatly disliked, he was taken prisoner in his own palace while he was discussing the subject of the war with his confederates, and they brought five of them as prisoners in his company. As that city stands close to the lake, they got ready a great pirogue with awnings, and they placed Kakamatsun and the other prisoners in it, and with a great crew of rowers they brought them to Mexico. When they had disembarked, they placed Kakamatsun in a richly adorned litter fit for a king such as he was, and with the greatest show of respect they brought him before Montezuma. It seems that in his interview with Montezuma, he was even more insolent than he had been before, and if Montezuma was angry with his nephew before, he was now doubly so, and he promptly sent him to our captain to be held as a prisoner, and the other prisoners he ordered to be set free. Cortez went at once to the palace of to Montezuma's chamber to thank him for so great a favor, and the order was given that the youth who was in Montezuma's company, who was also his nephew and the brother of Kakamatsin, should be raised to the kingship of Techcoco. So, as to make the appointment with all solemnity, and with the consent of all the city, Montezuma summoned before him the principal chieftains of the whole province, and, after fully discussing the matter, they elected him as king and lord of that great city, and he was named Don Carlos. After all this was over, when the caciques and kinglets, nephews of the great Montezuma, namely the lord of Coyoacan and the lord of Itzopalapa, and he of Tacuba, saw and heard of the imprisonment of Kakamatsin, and learned that the great Montezuma knew that they had joined in the conspiracy to deprive him of his kingdom and give it to Kakamatsin. They were frightened and did not come to pay their court to Montezuma as they were used to do. So with the consent of Cortez, who clamored and persuaded him to order them to be seized, within eight days they were all imprisoned and attached to the great chain, and our captain and all of us felt not a little relieved. When Captain Cortez saw that those kinglets named by me were prisoners, and that all the cities were at peace, he said to Montezuma that, before we had entered Mexico, he, Montezuma, had twice sent to say that he wished to pay tribute to his majesty, and that as he now understood about the great power of our lord and king, to whom many lands pay tribute and taxes, and many great kings are subject, it would be well for him and all his vassals to give him their fealty, for such is the custom, first to give fealty and then to give tribute and taxes. Montezuma replied that he would gather his vassals together and talk to them about it. And within ten days nearly all the caciques of that territory assembled together, but that cacique who was most nearly related to Montezuma did not come, and said that he would neither come nor pay taxes, for he was not able to keep himself with the income from his provinces. Montezuma was very angry at this reply, and at once sent some captains to take him prisoner. But as he was a great lord and had many relations, he was warned of this and withdrew to his province, where they were not then able to catch him. I must leave him now, and state how, in the discussion that Montezuma held with the caciques of all the territory whom he had called together, after he had made a speech without Cortez or any of us, excepting Ortigia the page, being present, it was reported that he had told them to consider how for many years past they had known for certain, through the traditions of their ancestors which they had noted down in their books of records, that men would come from the direction of the sunrise to rule these lands and that then the lordship and kingdom of the Mahicans would come to an end. Now he believed, from what his gods had told him, that we were those men, and the priests had consulted with Chilobos about it and offered up sacrifices, but their gods would no longer answer them as they had been accustomed to do. All that which Chilobos would give them to understand was that what he had told them before he now again gave as his reply, and they were not to ask him again, so that they took it to mean that they should give their fealty to the king of Spain, whose vassals these two say they are. He went on to say, 
As for the present, it does not imply anything, and as in time to come, we shall see whether we receive another and better reply from our gods, so we will act according to the time. For the present, what I order and beg you all to do with goodwill is to give and contribute some sign of vassalage, and I will soon tell you what is most suitable. And as just now I am importuned about it by Malinche, I beg that no one will refuse it. During the eighteen years that I have been your prince, you have always been very loyal to me, and I have enriched you, and have broadened your lands, and have given you power and wealth, and if at this present time our gods permit me to be held captive here, it would not have happened unless, as I have told you many times, my great Wichilobos had commanded it. When they heard these arguments, all of them gave as an answer that they would do as he had ordered them, and they said it with many tears and sighs, and Montezuma more tearful than any of them. Then he sent a chieftain to say that on the following day they would give their fealty and vassalage to his majesty. Montezuma returned after this to talk about the matter with his caciques, and in the presence of Cortez and our captains and many of our soldiers, and of Pedro Hernandez, Cortez's secretary, they gave their fealty to his majesty, and they showed much emotion in doing so, and Montezuma could not keep back his tears. He was so dear to us, and we were so much affected at seeing him weep, that our own eyes were softened, and one soldier wept as much as Montezuma. Such was the affection we had for him. We'll leave off here, and say that Cortez and the Frail de la Merced, who was very wise, were constantly in Montezuma's palace, trying to amuse him and to persuade him to give up his idols. As Captain Diego de Arda and the other soldiers, who had been sent by Cortez on an exploring expedition, arrived with samples of gold and the report that all the land was rich, Cortez, by the advice of Orda and the other captains and soldiers, decided to speak to, and demanded Montezuma that all the caciques and towns of the land should pay tribute to his majesty, and that he himself, as the greatest chieftain, should also contribute from his treasure. Montezuma replied that he would send to all his towns to ask for gold, but that many of them did not possess any, only some jewels of little worth, which had come to them from their ancestors. He at once dispatched chieftains to the places where there were mines, and ordered each town to give so many ingots of fine gold, of the same size and thickness as others that they were then used to pay as tribute, and the messengers carried with them as samples two small ingots. From other parts they only brought small jewels of little worth. He also sent to the province whose cacique and lord was that near kinsman of his who would not obey him. This province was distant from Mexico about twelve leagues, and the reply the messengers brought back was to the effect that neither would he give any gold, nor obey Montezuma, that he also was lord of Mexico, and that the dominion belonged to him as much as to Montezuma himself, who was sending to ask him to pay tribute. When Montezuma heard this, he was so enraged that he immediately sent his seal and sign by some faithful captains with orders to bring him as a prisoner. When this kinsman was brought into Montezuma's presence, he spoke to him very disrespectfully and without any fear, and very valiantly, and they say that he had intervals of madness, for he was as though thunderstruck. Cortez came to know all about this, and he sent to beg Montezuma as a favor to give this man to him, as he wished to place a guard over him, for he had been told that Montezuma had ordered him to be killed. When the cacique was brought before him, Cortez spoke to him in a most amiable manner, and told him not to act like a madman against his prince, and wished to set him free. However, when Montezuma heard this, he said that he should not be set free, but should be attached to the great chain, like the other kinglets already named by me. Let us go back to say that within twenty days all the chieftains who Montezuma had sent to collect the tribute of gold came back again, and as they arrived Montezuma sent to summon Cortez and our captains and certain soldiers whom he knew, who belonged to his guard, and said these formal words, or others of like meaning, I wish you to know, Signor Malinche and Signores captains and soldiers, that I am indebted to your great king and I bear him good will both for being such a great prince, and for having sent to such distant lands to make inquiries about me. And the thought that most impresses me is that he must be the one who is to rule over us, as our ancestors have told us, and as even our gods have given us to understand in the answers we have received from them. 
take this gold which has been collected on account of haste no more has been brought that which i have got ready for the emperor is the whole of the treasure which i have received from my father which is in your possession and in your apartments i know well enough that as soon as you came here you opened the chamber and beheld it all and that you sealed it up again as it was before when you send it to him tell him in your papers and letters this is sent to you by your true vassal montezuma i will also give you some very valuable stones which you will send to him in my name they are Chalchuites, and are not to be given to anyone else, but only to him, your great prince. Each stone is worth two loads of gold. I also wish to send him three blowguns with their bags and pellet bolts, for they have such good jewel work on them that he will be pleased to see them. And I also wish to give him of what I possess, although it is but little, for all the rest of the gold and jewels that I possessed I have given you from time to time. When Cortez and all of us heard this, we stood amazed at the great goodness and liberality of the great Montezuma, and with much reverence we all doffed our helmets and returned him our thanks, and with words of the greatest affection Cortez promised him that we would write to his majesty of the magnificence and liberality of this gift of gold which he gave us in his own royal name. After some more polite conversation, Montezuma at once sent his mayor domos to hand over all the treasure and gold and wealth that was in that plastered chamber, and in looking it over and taking off all the embroidery with which it was set, we were occupied for three days, and to assist us in undoing it and taking it to pieces, there came Montezuma's goldsmith from the town named Atzcapozalco, and I say that there was so much, that after it was taken to pieces there were three heaps of gold, and they weighed more than six hundred thousand pesos, as I shall tell further on, without the silver and many other rich things, and not counting in this the ingots and slabs of gold, and the golden grains from the mines. We began to melt it down with the help of the Indian goldsmiths, and they made broad bars of it, each bar measuring three fingers of the hand across. When it was already melted and made into bars, they brought another present separately, which the grand Montezuma had said that he would give, and it was a wonderful thing to behold the wealth of gold and the richness of the other jewels that were brought, for some of the Chaljuites were so fine that among these caciques they were worth a vast quantity of gold. The three blowguns with their pellet molds and their coverings of jewels and pearls and pictures and feathers of little birds covered with pearl shell and other birds, all were of great value. I will not speak of the plumes and feathers and other rich things, for I shall never finish calling them to mind. The gold I have spoken about was marked with an iron stamp, and the stamp was the royal arms. The mark was not put on the rich jewels, which it did not seem to us should be taken to pieces. As we had neither marked weights nor scales, some iron weights were made, some as much as an aroba, others of half an aroba, two pounds, one pound and half a pound, and of four ounces, not that they would turn out very exact, but within half an ounce more or less in each lot that was weighed. After the weight was taken, the officers of the king said that there was gold worth more than six hundred thousand pesos, and this was without counting the silver and many other jewels, which were not yet valued. Some soldiers said that there was more, as there was now nothing more to do than to take out the royal fifth, and to give to each captain and soldier his share, and to set aside the shares of those who remained at the port of Iarica. It seems that Cortez endeavored not to have it divided up so soon, but to wait until there was more gold, and there were good weights and proper accounts of how it turned out. But most of us captains and soldiers said that it should be divided up at once, for we had seen that at the time when the pieces were given out to the treasure of Montezuma, there was much more gold in the heaps, and that a third part of it was missing, which they had taken and hidden both on behalf of Cortez, as well as of the captains and the Frail de la Merced, and it went on diminishing. The next day they were to distribute the shares, and I will tell how it was divided, and the greater part remained with Captain Cortez and other persons, and what was done about it I will go on to relate. First of all, the royal fifth was taken out. Then Cortez said that they should take out for him another fifth, the same as for his majesty, for we had promised it to him at the sand dunes when we elected him Captain General and Chief Justice. After that, he said that he had been put to certain expenses in the island of Cuba, and that what he had spent on the expedition should be taken from the heap, and in addition to this, that there should be taken from the same heap the expenses incurred by Diego Velasquez in the ships which we had destroyed. 
We all agreed to it. Besides this, the expenses of the procurators who were sent to Spain. Then there were the shares of those who remained in Villarica, and there were seventy of them, and for his horse that had died, and for the mare which had belonged to Juan Cedeno, which the Tlaxcalans had killed with a sword cut, then for the Fraile de la Merced, and the priest Juan Diaz, and the captains, and for those who had brought horses, double shares, and for musketeers and crossbowmen the same, and other trickeries, so that very little was left to each as a share, and it was so little that many of the soldiers did not want to take it and Cortez was left with it all. At that time we could do nothing but hold our tongues, for to ask for justice in the matter was useless. There were other soldiers who took their shares at the rate of one hundred pesos, and clamored for the rest, and to content them Cortez secretly gave to one and the other, apparently bestowing favors so as to satisfy them, and with smooth speeches that he made to them they put up with it. At that time, many of our captains ordered very large golden chains to be made by the great Montezuma's goldsmiths. Cortez, too, ordered many jewels to be made, and a great service of plate. Some of our soldiers had their hands so full that many ingots of gold, marked and unmarked, and jewels of a great diversity of patterns were openly in circulation. Heavy gaming was always going on with some playing cards which were made from drum skins by Pedro Valenciano, were as well made and painted as the originals. So this was the condition we were in, but let us stop talking of the gold, and of the bad way it was divided, and the worse way in which it was spent. And as Cortez heard that many of the soldiers were discontented over their share of gold and the way the heaps had been robbed, he determined to make a speech to them all with honeyed words, and he said that all he owned was for us, and he did not want the fifth, but only the share that came to him as Captain General and that if any one had need of anything he would give it to him, and that the gold we had collected was but a breath of air, that we should observe what great cities there were there, and rich mines, and that we should be lords of them all, and very prosperous and rich, and he used other arguments very well expressed, which he knew well how to employ. One day Montezuma said, Look here, Malinche, I love you so much that I want to give you one of my daughters, who is very beautiful, so that you can marry her, and treat her as your legitimate wife. Cortez doffed his cap in thanks, and said that it was a great favor that Montezuma was conferring on him, but that he was already married and had a wife, and that among us we were not permitted to have more than one wife. He would, however, keep her, Montezuma's daughter, in the rank to which the daughter of so great a prince was entitled, but that first of all he desired her to become a Christian, as other ladies, the daughters of chieftains, already were, and to this Montezuma consented. The great Montezuma always showed good will to us, but he never ceased his sacrifices at which human beings were killed, and Cortez tried to dissuade him from this, but met with no success. So Cortez took counsel with his captains as to what should be done in the matter, for he did not dare to put an end to it for fear of a rising in the city, and of the priests who were in charge of Vichilobos. On the advice of the captains, Cortez went to the palace where Montezuma was imprisoned and took seven captains and soldiers with him, and said to Montezuma, Signor, I have often asked you not to sacrifice any more human beings to your gods who are deceiving you, and you will not cease doing it. I wish you to know that all my companions and these captains who are with me have come to beg you to give them leave to remove the gods from your temple and put Our Lady Santa Maria and a cross in their place. And if you will not give them leave now, they will go and remove them, and I would not like them to kill any priests. When Montezuma heard those words and saw that the captains were rather angry, he said, Oh, Malinche, how can you wish to destroy the city entirely? For our gods are very angry with us, and I do not know that they will stop even at your lives. What I pray you to do for the present is to be patient. And I will send to summon all the priests, and I will see their reply. When Cortez heard this, he made a sign that he wished to speak pri privately to Montezuma. When they were left alone, he said to Montezuma that in order to prevent this affair from becoming known and causing a disturbance and becoming an offense to the priests on account of their idols being overturned, that he would arrange with these captains to the effect that they should do nothing of the sort, provided they were given an apartment in the great queue where they might make an altar on which to place the image of Our Lady and set up a cross. Then Montezuma, with sighs and a very sorrowful countenance, 
said that he would confer with his priests. After much discussion had taken place, it was agreed to, and our altars and an image of Our Lady and a cross were set up, apart from their cursed idols, with great reverence and with thanks to God from all of us. And the Padre de la Merced chanted Mass, assisted by the priest Juan Diaz and many of our soldiers. Our captain ordered an old soldier to be stationed there as guardian, and begged Montezuma to order the priest not to touch the altar, but only to keep it swept and burn incense and keep wax candles burning there by day and night, and to decorate it with branches and flowers. There was never a time when we were not subject to surprises of such a kind, that had our Lord God not assisted us, they would have cost us our lives. Thus, as soon as we had placed the image of Our Lady and the cross on the altar which we had made on the great queue, and the Holy Gospel had been preached and Mass said, it seems that Huichilobos and Tezcatlipuca spoke to the priests, and told them that they wished to leave their country, as they were so badly treated by the Tuls, and they did not wish to stay where those figures and the cross had been placed, nor would they remain there unless we were killed, and this was their answer, and they need not expect any other, and they should inform Montezuma then to all his captains, so that they might at once go to war and kill us. The idols further told them that they could on could see how the, all the gold that used to be kept for their honor had been broken up by us and made into ingots, and let them beware how we were making ourselves lords over the country, and we were holding five great caciques prisoners, and they told them of the other misdeeds so as to induce them to attack us. In order that Cortez and all of us should know about this, the great Montezuma sent word to tell Cortez that he wished to speak to him on very important matters, and the page Ortiguilla came and said to him that Montezuma was very sad and much disturbed, and that during the previous night and part of the day, many priests and leading captains had been with him, and had said things to him privately that he, the page, could not understand. When Cortez heard this, he went in haste to the palace where Montezuma was staying, and took with him Cristobal de Olid, who was captain of the guard, and four other captains, and Doña Marina and Jeronimo de Aguilar. And after they had paid much respect to him, Montezuma said, O oh, Signor Malinche and captains, how distressed I am at the reply and command which our Teuls have given to our priests, and to me and all my captains, which is that we should make war on you and kill you, and drive you back across the sea. I have thought it over, and what seems to me the best is that you should at once leave this city before you are attacked, and that not one of you should remain here. This, Signor Malinche, I say that you should not fail to do, for it is in your interest. If not, you will be killed. Remember, it is a question of your lives. Cortez and our captains felt grief at what he said, and were even a good deal disquieted. And it was not to be wondered at the affair came so suddenly and with such insistence that our lives were at once placed to the greatest danger by it, for the warning was given us with the greatest urgency. Cortez replied that he thanked Montezuma sincerely for the warning, and that at the present time there were two things that troubled him. One was that he had no vessels in which to sail, for he had ordered those in which he had come to be broken up, and the other was that Montezuma would be forced to come with us so that our great emperor might see him and that he begged as a favor that he would place restraint on his priests and captains while three ships were being built at the sand dunes, as it would be more advantageous to them, for if they began the war they would all of them be killed. He also asked, so that Montezuma might see that he wished to carry out what he had said without delay, that carpenters might be sent with two of our soldiers, who were great experts in shipbuilding, to cut wood near the sand dunes. Montezuma was even more sorrowful than before because Cortez told him that he would have to come with us before the emperor. He said that he would send the carpenters, and that they should hurry and not waste time in talk, but work, and that meanwhile he would command the priests and captains not to ferment disturbances in the city, and he would order Huichilobos to be appeased with sacrifices, but not of human lives. After this exciting conversation, Cortez and his captains took leave of Montezuma, and we were all in the greatest anxiety, wondering when they would begin the attack. Then Cortez ordered Martin Lopez, the ship carpenter, to be summoned, and Andre Nunez and the Indian carpenters whom the great Montezuma had given him, and after some discussion as to the size of the three vessels to be built, he ordered him at once to set about the work and to get them ready for in Villarica there was everything necessary in the way of iron and blacksmiths, tackle, tow, and caulkers, and pitch. So they set out and cut the wood on the east coast, 
near Viarica, and in haste began to build ships. Let us leave him building the ships, and say how we all went about in that city very much depressed, fearing that at any moment they might attack us. And our friends from Clashcala and Doña Marina also told the captain that an attack was probable, and Ortegia, Montezuma's page, was always in tears. We all kept on the alert and placed a strong guard over Montezuma, and we slept shod and armed and with all our weapons to hand, and our horses stood saddled and bridled all day long. There is another thing I must say, but not with the intention of boasting about it, that I grew so accustomed to go about armed and to sleep in the way I have said, that after the conquest of New Spain I kept the habit of sleeping in my clothes and without a bed, and I slept thus better than on a mattress.